Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I thank you for participating in the TCRP Report 185, Part 2, Bus Operator Workstation Design for Improving Occupational Health and Safety webinar. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today we are pleased to have Andrew Kroom as our presenter. Andrew Kroom is a Senior Research Associate in the Center for Truck and Bus Safety at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Andrew's educational background is a mixture of engineering, psychology, and human factors. His professional background is in the commercial vehicle industry, working nine years as a human factors and ergonomics specialist, advising program and engineering teams in the safety, comfort, and health needs of occupational drivers among North American commercial, global, and military operations. He holds a Class A CDL driver's license. Andrew has been a researcher at VTTI for four years. He currently leads and supports research for the FTA, FMCSA, NHTSA, NIOSH, and the NAS, and the NAS, sorry, in addition to private research. His research interests include occupational driver and automated vehicle performance integration, vehicle controls and interface and design, and vehicle technology testing and evaluation. Today's webinar format consists of Andrew presenting his material, followed by a question and answer session at the end. You can participate in the discussion at the end by hitting star 1 on the phone at the designated time or by using the chat pod that is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you have not already printed out a copy of the presentation that was emailed to you, you can click on the handout document in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You can also email Barbara Van Dyke at bvandyke at nti.rutgers.edu and she will be glad to assist you. I will now turn the presentation over to Andrew. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lori. Uh, as Lori said, this is part two of the webinar on, on Report 185, Bus Operator Workstation Design for Improving uh, Occupational Health and Safety. And I'll be focusing on the design tools that were developed during this project. And uh, Lori gave my background. And as she said, I spent many years working in industry, <clears throat> kind of using the practices and models that I'll be demonstrating um, and, and activities that I actually used as part of in my, in my past work. So the purpose of this project was to develop and support improved bus procurement by public transit agencies and focus on bus operator workstation components of transit bus. And the research produced practical guidance documents and tools that would be applicable to the procurement process and bus design, including user-friendly design guidelines and digital models. The project team included myself uh, from the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute as the project lead and developer of the workstation design. Also, Dr. Robin Gillespie from RM Gillespie Consulting uh, supported this project heavily and completed the agency and practices outreach. And hopefully you were able to join us uh, last uh, two weeks ago for the first part of this webinar where she discussed some of the uh, uh, procurement practices or recommendations for including bus operators and training of procurement teams. Also, Mr. Daryl Bowman, formerly with VTTI, supported with the design feature guideline development. And Dr. Michael Belzer from Sound Science Incorporated was our project uh, economist. And he provides a nice overview in the appendix on uh, bus operator workstation features, looking at return on investment versus the benefit cost analysis approach to support future research efforts in this area. The mission of the project was to promote design and support safe, productive, and healthy users. The transit bus operators have a demanding job. Biomechanical demands of sedentary posture and controls with high forces are required in the job, including personal stress, uh, resulting in personal stress of interacting with passengers, and constant cognitive demands of traffic, pedestrians, and schedule. And all these impact the bus operator performance, which can lead to absenteeism, musculoskeletal disorders, or chronic disease. A major overarching goal of this project was to find opportunities then to plug the user or the bus operator into the process of specifying their needs. My own experiences in vehicle design involved in the past, I sought to insert the users, whether it be commercial truck drivers, commercial bus drivers, uh, international 
and military personnel into the design process throughout development cycles. An overview of the report is provided here, and I've highlighted the chapters from the sections we'll be discussing today, chapters four, five, and six, primarily with some of the appendices. We'll be focusing on the bus doctor workstation design guidelines, also looking at the human modeling validation component, and then going into some of the conclusions, and then I'll be uh, providing some uh, detailed review of the, of the models and tools we've provided. I'll also be providing a live demonstration of the 3D uh, PDF model. So the objectives of this webinar I have are part one, first of all, to discuss the background on what decisions and processes led to the design practice we have here. And then part two, go through the design process a little bit, and then end by giving some, highlighting some recommendations and then demonstrating how the tools can be used. First of all, in part one, in the background. The mission here for the product team was to update bus operator workstation ergonomic design guideline, which was provided in an earlier report that was completed in 1997, TCRP report 25. First, before I just discuss uh, what the research team learned in preparing to update report 25, We recognize, I want to recognize that this was basically intended to be a project where we would update a previous design guideline. And in any design iteration, uh, it's good to pause for a moment and consider that any complex product is a balance of many factors. And it is the job of strong engineering uh, companies and organizations to balance those factors for the needs of their users. And that is true also for the bus operator workstation and the buses that we all work with. So some of the components in any product, whether it be buses or phones, that they have to be balanced for size, shape, weight, strength, interface with the user, reliability, and efficiency. Bus design and the operator workstation requires a careful balance of the items that serve the design elements that interface through and around the seated bus operator. So these elements might also be called user needs. For example, reach, comfort, and access. And then the arrangement of the workstation items, for example, seats, steering wheels, and controls, requires the breakdown of these pieces and then reorganization of the recommended modified pieces, if you will, in the workstation. So the mission, as I said, was to update Report 25. Looking at that, the process from TCRP Report 25, we, we studied the, the research team studied this uh, report in detail. Parts of it are publicly available for download, and parts of it are, are also public but a little more difficult to get to. And we looked over all of the appendices and the elements that led to Report 25 to try to understand the full background of this project. We noticed that some things were done very well, such as capturing key tasks for the bus operator surveying bus operators for recommended design aspects of the workstation elements, and conducting user testing with mock-ups. Some areas we noticed are that uh, could be improved in the updated guideline, or Report 185, which is what we're discussing here, were the fact that in Report 25, they used univariate anthropometric data uh, rather than multivariate anthropometric data, which is a combination of the real measures, of whether it be arm length or seating height, et cetera. The fundamental reference established there in that project was a seat reference, which seems kind of uh, maybe somewhat uh, uh, very detailed to, di to discuss, but this, this assumption led to the guidance that was provided in Report 25. And um, when you use a seat reference rather than what all other vehicles use in uh, commercial and light vehicle design, which is a floor reference, it can require a scene in the picture to the left that there be an adjustable floor height, not only adjustable pedals, but adjustable floor. So the research team looked at that and decided that the uh, typical heel approach would be best. So we actually, rather than just update Report 25, we reset on a new path with Report 185. We uh, did this by applying the existing bus operator workstation envelope as a boundary. We based, as I'm going to say in a moment in the process, we, uh, we wanted to keep what works and recognize that this wasn't a blank sheet design. We want to provide improvements in, in the near term, 
not uh, 20 years down the road. So we started with the existing transit low floor bus uh, boundaries. Then identified the key reference points, meaning accelerator heel point, seat points, which are referred to as H points, sometimes the, understood to be generically the hip point where drivers sit uh, in seats. And a visibility target, which is well known from the APTA procurement guide, otherwise known as the White Book, that provides downward visibility guidance. We reorganized these pieces with updated design criteria according to well-known uh, SAE Class B vehicle packaging guidelines. I provided this slide just for reference. I won't describe each of these recommended practices, but they're here for your review in the future. They're also available in the report. Additionally, I provide some references here in the background of these recommended practices. And I'd like to uh, just to highlight the fact that this design process is used for commercial and non-commercial vehicle development, and that continues alongside modeling tools used today. The processes that are applied uh, that were applied in this work in Report 185 are reliable. However, un updates of those processes are ongoing and the data that they rely on. So moving on to the process we used to develop this guideline and the model, the mission was to improve what needs updating without eliminating what works. The approach we took were these seven steps. I'll be highlighting steps one, three, four, five, and six. Uh, the steps and the results of the agency interview surveys and preparing training and practices were covered in the first webinar uh, two weeks ago. And if anyone uh, does not have access to that slide deck, we can provide it afterwards. In step one, we collected operator health research design practices and criteria handbooks, as well as recommended practices and the bus workstation envelope, then compared the needs as identified through interviews and surveys and the research to the existing design today. We then developed updated guideline and CAD models and performed human modeling validation on that model, and then extracted the design tools and then use those to position them inside of training and practices that were discussed before. So first of all, in the collection, what do we start with? Uh, we started with these guidelines, Report 25, which provides an excellent uh, list of guidelines for the transit bus operator workstation. And the American Public Transportation Association, or APTA White Book, provides some workstation guidelines. We also use some international guidelines, such as European Bus System of the Future, and the ISO road vehicle ergonomic requirements. We collected all these into a matrix which is provided as an appendix to the design tool one. The design tool one is the feature guideline that I'll discuss in a moment. Taking that, those inputs, we also wanted to account for the real vehicle data since we needed to produce a 3D model as a result of this deliverable for this project. We started by working with a North American uh, transit bus manufacturers that shared the basic uh, boundaries for the transit bus operator workstation. Then our research team measured components and dimensions on two major North American transit buses and used those components to then guide our processes uh, relative to some of the components that are existing there today on buses and then make improvements from there. So the pathway was to collect the requirements, or excuse, excuse me, collect the guidelines in step A that I listed already. Then we used recommended practices from SAE to combine those uh, guidance uh, dimensions and uh, put them into CAD model as shown in step C. Then we delivered individual component feature guidelines in D and that is available in a tool now. We did modeling validation and they resulted by exporting the data into 3D format that can be used for engineering and also a 3D PDF uh, that can be used by anyone. Some details on the design. This process led to the development of common transit bus engineering design references. We recognized, and I recognized from my background in working in engineering uh, and vehicle design domain, that it's important to provide some world reference that would be useful to engineers. So we actually looked across, looked at the bus as a whole, and try to determine what references would be helpful to designers, uh, engineers, and manufacturers, component suppliers to all discuss. And they're, they're really uh, 
relative to the vehicle architecture, it's obvious that the front axle is an excellent reference. In addition, the bumper, which provides reference for visibility guidance in the Apto White Book. And then the heel point, which is a very important packaging reference, as I described earlier, would be the starting point, is the starting point for all vehicle packaging exercises. We then uh, took the SAE recommended practices available for seats, turn wheel clearances, and visibility references. Put them all together to produce the model and integrated them into 3D guidance. We also applied some other guidelines that I'm aware of, some are obvious, such as the sun visor limits that are provided in the Apto White Book. And uh, additional ones that are available for light commercial vehicles for display positioning. Uh, showing the upper left corner, and then combine it all into the integrated 3D guidance. The next step was to validate this model. All the dimensions and pieces are being put back together and reorganized need to confirm that they were realistic. To do this, we had decided to use human modeling validation. And uh, that means that we had to make mannequins which would be used for that validation. These human models were carefully built based on a recent 2011 NIOSH truck driver survey. And they included three males and three females were selected based on their body measures. One small female was also developed based on the NHANES 3 anthropometry to protect for a changing population of drivers. Our panel during this project wisely advised us to be aware that the population is increasing in the number of drivers who come from Latino, Hispanic, and Mexican uh, descent. And so we need to recognize the size uh, might be adjusting in the future, and we need to validate relative to those seven. I also highlight in this slide a range of statures. Stature alone should not be considered uh, a key dimension when you are uh, designing, but it highlights here the size range of uh, drivers and the population we are, drivers in this case, bus operators we are seeking to represent from first percentile up to 98th percentile in female and first to 97th in male. And one more um, on this area. Uh, one more note on this area of human modeling anthropometry. The research team would have preferred to verify that the model with transit bus drivers. However, that recent survey of North American drivers did provide excellent detail and it's difficult to get uh, population measurements at that level of detail that could be used to develop mannequins. And these types of surveys are very rare outside of mainly military uh, subpopulations. So while we recognize that the drivers surveyed are heavier than the general population based on this data, you can also see that transit bus measures of the population show that there's a similar population status for transit bus drivers as there are for other occupational drivers. So moving on past the anthropometry into the validation, what we did with those uh, mannequins is position them into the guidance model, and then we had to iterate the model further and confirm that it matched all of the guidelines and or update the guidelines to, to match the model. We were able to observe that the steering wheel range we had selected, the seating minimum seating uh, position range, and feet could remain on the floor, eyes could remain targeted on the visibility target. Additionally, some of the guidance we provided on the knee clearances and stomach clearances were confirmed relative to these posturing models. And as an output, we were also able to develop reach curves for fingertip and grasp, which were provided now with the model at a 600 millimeter height above the pedal floor in the operator workstation. So moving into part three, I'll highlight a few recommendations and then we'll go through the tools. The mission was to identify improvements and useful tools that connect the purchasers 
to the designers. As I mentioned before, I've been in this place where I'm an advocate for users and drivers and operators in previous work uh, prior to joining VTTI. And while I was there, I was involved in uh, many, um, many activities, including uh, the drivers and users in the development cycle. So some recommendations that I would like to highlight here. Uh, there are many good ones in the guideline and integrated, as I mentioned, in the, in the 3D models. I would like to highlight a few that I think we should reach for in the near term. There is a, a much discussion on thermal and security barriers, and because of that, we provided an access door uh, recommendation. We assume that the best thermal and security barrier may be one that completely surrounds the operator, although there are other designs we recognize there. We provided an access door clearance that would account for the position of steps that are likely in the operator workspace, as well as the size of drivers, operators that need to get in and out of that area. In addition, stomach clearance is recommended with an adjustable column position. Now, this is uh, an interesting um, point because down below you'll notice we are recommending changes to the standard steering wheel angles that are there today in the buses. Um, what they do well at being very horizontal or close to zero degrees in steering wheel position is they do provide access for operators to enter and exit the operator workstation between the seat and steering wheel. So we're recommending that the column still maintain an adjustment position for that access. Uh, the platform step clearance recommending minimum foot, if you will, like a foot clearance for those steps. It's a very busy area, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, passenger handles and fare boxes can often get in the way of the step that is designed for the operator, uh, not for the fare box. And then the street side window, uh, we've highlighted this because the recommendations in the After White Book regarding the lower limits of the street side window above the operator platform. We've also provided a recommendation for emergency access. This is especially important as we consider the thermal and security barriers that may be added and are being added around the workstation. Relative to the steering wheel, I'd like to highlight the column should dampen vibration, and the diameter should be targeting 18 inches, other than larger than that. The neutral horizontal angle we've recommended is 27 degrees with plus or minus 20 degrees of adjustment. And the torque required to turn the steering wheel should be kept uh, should be controlled. So it's that a 10 degrees rotation should be no less than 5 foot pounds and no more than 10 foot pounds. And on the pedals, the accelerator pedal force will provide a recommendation as well. And because of that, we've highlighted a clearance zone that's available in the ISO guideline for uh, clearance. Uh, I was involved in many design exercises where components tend to come into the pedal area. And one would think that's a sacred area, but unfortunately, uh, there are components that tend to uh, move into that area, so that keep-out zone is important. And now I want to take a few moments to highlight the design guidance tools that we hope will be useful for you now and in the future. First of all, the feature guideline, I'll show three examples. But first of all, how it should be used. The guideline is available in a Word document, so you can copy and paste out of it. And the headings are provided according to areas within the workstation. And then components uh, are labeled for quick and easy uh, searching and navigation in that uh, word heading window. Each guideline provides a definition. And some of them have figures where possible, in addition to design uh, guideline parameter and an explanation of the need for the guideline, as shown here for this string wheel diameter. Another example here is of that, that 27 degrees steering wheel angle, which has been recommended. And another here, without a figure, is the bus operator platform access, where we highlight the step clearances need to be, that need to be maintained, as well as emergency access needs on the street side. Moving on, I'm highlighting uh, this uh, image of a CAD model. Now, I want to make it clear that only the solid model data is available for the CAD model in IGIS and STEP files. 
But that was an important requirement from the very beginning of this project, that engineering data be available on the guidance we're providing so that uh, and it could be useful in any CAD format. Um, the popular, I could list several of the popular uh, uh, softwares, but I won't. But I just and step files work with them all. And then I'll be moving on to this online demonstration here in a moment. Before I do, uh, well, the reason we did this 3D PDF is I have I found it tremendously useful in my past experience in industry. And we had to produce the CAD design models, but recognizing that we want more people in the procurement process. Uh, maintainers and others uh, who work around these buses often to be part of the procurement team, and they often are, excuse me, they often are, but want to be able to inform and provide them as many tools as they're interested in using. And so we exported this 3D PDF uh, as I'll highlight here in a moment. Tools uh, like this model provide visual communication aids for the procurement team to reference the human performance needs of bus operators, and it provides this information uh, with those elements of comfort control, reach visibility, and access that are all connected in the same space. So that design guideline, feature guideline document allows you to view two-dimensional you know, two dimensional, um, information, whereas in, in this case, we've taken that two-dimensional information or even one-dimensional features, and we put them together. So now I'm going to try uh, to, to uh, go to another screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see the screen okay. Lori, are you there? Is it looking okay? I'm here. It looks okay. Um, it might look better if everybody went full screen right now, so it, it appears bigger. Um, you won't be able to see yeah, the chat box, or, but uh, it'll be a bigger view. Um, In the upper right corner, I believe, of yes. the Adobe Connect, there's a green four-way arrow you can click on. Yes, and then uh, you can shrink it again by hovering at the top of the page, and the arrows go the other direction. So um, it's a good option to, to see what Andrew's talking about. Good job. Thank <laughs> you. All right, thank you. So I'll proceed uh, by just explaining this 3D model. And really, this is uh, exactly uh, the same uh, similar elements you would see, I believe, all the same elements you see in the CAD model, uh, but it requires expensive software to view those and use those, whereas this anyone can download using uh, Adobe PDF. So what we're seeing here, I have just a few components turned on right now, and this gray area on the lower is the ground, and then the purple represents the passenger floor. We had to make things very generic so as not to uh, duplicate too closely any of the vehicles that we benchmarked. And then, so the passenger floor is the purple, the green is the pedal floor, and then the uh, tan brown is, is the uh, seat floor, which provides references for seat suppliers. The blue points represent a seat range and full down, full forward, full up. And the, this parallelogram is common with the recommended practices in SAE, even though many of the seats uh, produce a rather square uh, forward, rearward, up-down box. This steering wheel is positioned at the recommended neutral position at 27 degrees. And then we have a represented gauge display, represented turn signal floor bracket. And then these red spheres are representing fiducial references that can help in positioning this model. And uh, the red sphere in the rear here is the axle center of the vehicle at the height of the pedal floor. And then this big gray box is a representative of a rather large, although not the largest, uh, fare box. We recognize the packaging requirements that is part of the challenge for the uh, for the procurement team and, and uh, manufacturers. I also have turned on accelerator pedal, and this yellow tube is representing the to visibility guideline relative to the bumper here. So now we're looking at the street side. We'd be looking through the street side window right now if we were looking at the bus. 
Okay, I will turn on a few pieces here. I apologize if I have to uh, peck around on the model here, but what I want to highlight over in the left area, you see these named parts. They represent the uh, components that uh, you'd want to use in the design guideline relative to the guideline. And some of them I'd like to highlight. I'll turn them on piece by piece here are the controls. We provide steering wheel recommendation positions other than the single position. And a steering wheel position for access, the seat. You notice it's far forward and forward of zero degrees or forward of, of the vertical position. Whereas the other positions are recommended tilt telescope range. Okay, we also have uh, fingertip reach and and uh, grasp reach curves that are provided, as I mentioned, the result of the packaging uh, model work that was done. The yellow is fingertip, as you can reach more with your finger, and the red is grasp. These are primary controls, and we compared all of the, uh, the seven uh, mannequins to determine the uh, shortest reach of fingertip and grasp and then provided these as guidance for the shortest reach. I'd also like to highlight a steering wheel clearance envelope positioned around the uh, steering wheel positioned at the uh, center point. I'll turn off the other steering wheels to make that clear. And at any time you want to figure out what you are looking at, you can simply click on it, and it is highlighted in the model tree here to the left. The model tree can be turned off and on by simply right-clicking on the model, hide model tree, or right-clicking again, show model tree. And there's a user guide also available on the TCRP Report 185 webpage. I've also highlighted a few other components here. I'll turn some things off to make it easier to understand. I'd like to highlight some of the access features I've discussed. Um, the step clearances, uh, we have provided 127 millimeter discs that we've positioned on likely step locations. There's one. There's a second. And a third. The one single step is assuming that the step, the step size to get up to the operator workstation is often limited, so we required or suggested requiring um, one single foot clearance for sure, and then two on the operator floor. Make sure that the, the seat floor does not move into, or the fare box does not move into that space so that the operator can rotate around on the seat or off the seat when getting on and off. Uh, additionally, I mentioned a steering wheel clearance position for access. I'd also like to highlight uh, emergency access window clearances were provided in the model at the same position as recommended for minimum visibility in the after white book, both rearward of the heel point and vertical above the heel point reference limits. And lastly, I will highlight some visibility guidance we provided here. Some of that pulled right from the white book and other areas. In this case, I will show the ellipses that were developed as part of the visibility guidance and are often used today in procurement. They are positioned at a uh, 95th percentile size relative to SAE J941 appendix. Additionally, we have the visibility, um, the visibility planes for uh, out of the after white book. And I'll turn some of those on now. That's a minimum visibility reference and minimum upward visibility off of the ellipses, minimum downward visibility, which you can see connects with the after, after uh, visibility target. And uh, let me see if I can find the sun visors as well. Sun visor angle front and left visibility guidance. So those are uh, some of the features available in this model. 
And before I end this demonstration, I'd also like to highlight a few uh, tools that are, that are nice to have and nice to know about in the 3D PDF. Uh, some of them include, uh, you can change how you use the mouse here uh, by rotating, spinning, or pan. You can also do 3D measurements. I'll show that in a moment because I'll first do a cross-section. You can do a cross-section of this model if you want to try to take dimensions across the section of the visibility plane or other components here. And there we have a cross-section along the Z. I will try to zoom out and rotate to get a clear view. I can move that cross-section up or down, and it changes where that cross-section occurs on the Z axis. And then by using that, I can also do some dimensions, as I mentioned. I can do dimensions with or without the cross-section, but I think it's nice to see it turned on. And you see this dimension box appears up here. You can make them perpendicular dimensions or not. All these perpendiculars are turned on, and I'll zoom in. And I can take a dimension here off of that steering wheel position to the floor. Try another one. And then that dimension can be clicked and represented in the view. And those dimensional views appear down here on the left. So uh, hopefully that's a uh, useful step for some people who may not be able to use CAD models but still want to get some idea of the dimensions provided in this guideline. And you can make it disappear by just disabling the cross section here in this box, closing, and hitting escape. Okay, I'll go back to the presentation. And uh, if there are any questions on this, then maybe I can, at, at the end, we take all the questions. We'll go over that. Okay, Lori, are we looking good again? Uh, yes, you're back on slide number 30. Okay, great. So I'll close up now. Okay. We're almost done, and then we'll head to questions. Um, so in conclusion, uh, in this process, designing this model, we sought to select a path that would provide success for operators, needs, purchasers and designers to work together through these guidelines in, um, in both in guidelines and in communication and then build the foundation for immediate and future improvements. We've highlighted some of the near-term improvements here in this discussion and then provided uh, tools to apply uh, now and in the future. And I just wanted to highlight that we uh, it's our intent to provide an integrated model to define the bus operator workstation as a whole. And as, as a whole, we all recognize that we cannot have accommodating, we cannot accommodate the bus operator and sacrifice passenger compartment at the same time. They have to work together. Likewise, the bus operator seating cannot be minimized just to meet visibility requirements. And the steering wheel adjustment range should not be reduced to provide for seat access. They're, they're all needed by the operator and our customers and passengers, and so it was our intent to, tr to provide something that could integrate them. So I'd like to close by thanking the Transit Cooperative Research Program, the National Academies, for sponsorship of Project C22. And we couldn't have done it without the transit organizations, manufacturers, fleets and agencies, unions, and experts that supported the research guideline, uh, especially these organizations, TCRP, APTA, and the Federal Transit Administration. I'd also like to thank Lori and the National Transit Institute for the support of this webinar. And I should also mention that BTTI is honored to be supporting future work with transit agencies under the FTA that will dovetail nicely with this work launching into research on visibility and object detection. So now we're at the question period. Uh, there's some call-in instructions listed at the top, and maybe Lori would like to explain them or or Toy? Uh, I think Toy, can you um, handle the questions? Yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask an audio question, please press star 1 on your phone. I'd also like to add that a question can be typed in the chat box and um, if you're phone shy, and I will uh, read it. There are currently no audio questions. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what do you want to do? Yeah. Okay, I was just pausing uh, 
if, if anyone does have questions afterwards, too, we welcome you to email them to either uh, Robin or myself, uh, and uh, we can direct them to whoever which, which of us is uh, best able to answer that. Uh, the design guidelines oh. are available, and the training and current practices are all available on the PCR P report 185 link that's provided here in the presentation. Andrew, Andrew, I, this is Robin Valesky here. Um, I was wondering, can we ask a question of our participants that they might want to answer? I, I have a question I would love them to answer. Okay. Which is, um, do they have any thoughts about how they would use these tools? Can they describe any plans um, or ideas for us? As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, please press star one. And then I believe you have to state your name also. And uh, I might provide an example too while we're waiting. Uh, when I was involved in a design exercise before, we, we used uh, 3D models, we used uh, mock ups and others. Uh, these this 3D PDF was actually something that we started using in engineering. I think it's become quite common now. It provides uh, pretty much anyone, any laptop, any conference room can pull up this element, uh, this 3D PDF, and, and talk about it. Use, to, use it to highlight uh, needs that are or are not being met, and even just as conversation points. And uh, what we would do is in large conference rooms, we would pull up these models of the engineering components. These are kind of the in-between engineering components. Sometimes people uh, ask me to, to explain what is this model these envelopes really providing. Um, I, I tell them that they should imagine a situation where they find themselves needing to furnish their living room, but they aren't able to pick all the pieces out themselves exactly. But they want to communicate the size of people and their family that will be using it their preferences, and basically comes down to, you know, listing their requirements. And I had to do this, too, in providing performance requirements and needs for the users and drivers and operators that I've represented in the past. And I couldn't tell the designers and engineers exactly what I wanted. I couldn't pick it for them, but I'd tell them the requirements that needed to be met. And then I let them use their expertise to help figure out how to get there. There's a question in the chat box. Do you want me to read it or? Sure, I, I, I guess I can or read response, it. Or uh, response, rather. Okay. Jim, thank you. Uh, we're currently working on a feasibility to create a procurement team. I'll read it in case anyone is uh, just on the phone. In order to include the enclosures, excuse me, I believe that's enclosures in the design development phase, uh, these would help provide prospective team members as they move through the process. Okay, great. I'm, I'm assuming the enclosures are uh, for like thermal security enclosures. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I do see that. I was reading the D as a C to include the end users. That's great. Yeah, I hope that that I hope that you can uh, do that. And uh, like you said, hopefully it's in an, in a easy to use format on any laptop, uh, so that whatever uh, your setup is, and you can. You can spin it around. You might even want to take parts of it and select dimensions, uh, as I should, to uh, discuss whether that meets your user group. Um, I encounter this in design exercises where we, we would have lists of requirements, and it's our job to balance them out correctly. So um, in many intent, our intent here in many of these is to provide minimum and or recommended uh, performance. I think the procurement after White Book also is taking this approach where it provides minimum and then some stretch goals to improve uh, for the, the users, whether it be uh, handicap support or whether it be bus operator, uh, workstation, or passenger area, et cetera. And from Brian uh, Funk, I see have these measures been put into an existing bus to get feedback from actual transit bus operators and drivers? And mostly, would the changes be dramatic or minimal from existing after standards? 
I think the no, the to answer your first question, no, they haven't been put into uh, a bus uh, completely together yet. Many of them are actually close to what exists in the Act of White Book. For example, the visibility upward sun visors, uh, etc., are there, and so some of them we just grabbed and put them in to help. I would say the biggest change. Uh, we're recommending is on forces in uh, components such as pedals and steering wheel, uh, an, an area that we're uh, highlighting. If I were an engineering organization looking to make a difference, I think I would look hard at the steering wheel and uh, the angles provided there. Right now, the angle is very flat, and that was very common in many vehicles. And I, I won't presume that that's only the only reason, but it used to be that the steering wheel had to be flat in order to have enough torque to turn the wheel, uh, using it as a lever arm. And that's no longer the case. And so many vehicles today, they are, uh, they are commercial vehicles, they have gone to a more vertical angle. Uh, we're not nowhere near recommending automotive, which is 45, 55 degree angle. We're talking about 27 degrees with adjustment up and down. I believe that change would help with the uh, the stretch and the shoulder um, and maybe back issues that operators have. But I also recognize that access to the seat is provided successfully with the very flat steering wheel today because both of the major uh, manufacturer models we tried, uh, it went forward at zero, which is a good, as I said, but even in commercial trucks, I know um, from at least a couple of them, one of them I helped design, uh, we developed so that the steering column could move forward of, of the positions that are used for driving. However, we also had very appropriate positions for driving separate from just access. And that might be produced with just a small lever in below the adjustment tilt telescope, but I recognize that would be a change. Uh, a big change from what's available today. Does anyone else have any questions or uh, answers? There is no one in the queue. Okay. Uh, Andrew, Robin, we wrap it up? Yes, yeah, sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. I, I hope it was useful. I welcome your feedback and any contacts on this in the future. I hope this is a, a, a help set a foundation for improvements in the future. In the future excuse me. And if you have any problems with any of the models or questions, like I said, you know, feel free to reach out. And uh, we want to help support them be useful for you. Great. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. A special thank you to Andrew for a very informative presentation. As a reminder, everyone should be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation for this event. Uh, it will come in an email survey. Uh, NTI will greatly appreciate your feedback, so please take a couple of minutes and fill that out for us. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect and have a great day.